The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staten, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about China's what I call high-risk, high-reward vaccine diplomacy. Uh, Listen, last week on Friday, Beijing issued a surprise announcement that China would join more than 170 other countries in the COVID-19 Vaccine Global Alliance Facility, uh, otherwise known as COVAX. And this really marked a sharp pivot in Beijing's vaccine diplomacy strategy that we at China Africa Project have been following very closely. And people obviously on the continent are very interested in this because getting access to affordable, if not free vaccines when they are available is critical. Now, until last week, Chinese officials had largely resisted joining the World Health Organization-backed Vaccine Alliance, hinting instead that a bilateral distribution strategy would fulfill President Xi Jinping's promise to make any future C-19 vaccine available to Africa and other developing regions as what they're calling a global public good. Now, that's going to be a topic of our discussion today to figure out what exactly is a global public good in the, the eyes of the Chinese government there. Now, the key question for Africa is whether the Chinese will leverage this new relationship with COVAX as a possible distribution partner for various Chinese vaccines that are now in late stage development. So get this, currently there are four of the world's 10 vaccines are in phase three clinical trials and they're all being produced by Chinese companies. While the first formally approved Chinese made vaccine is expected to be available as soon as November, Officials have not indicated as to how they plan to distribute these vaccines internationally, when they will be available, which countries will need to pay, and those who receive it as medical aid or grants. Uh, Participation in COVID could very well answer some of these questions. Kobus, now I guess the question for you that I have is that this seems like a very big deal for Africa because of the promises that China has made. But yet since Friday... There has really been no attention paid on the continent to this announcement that China's joining COVAX. No one was really talking about it on Twitter. None of the major newspapers were covering it. And it kind of just went by. No one really paid any attention. I got to be honest with you, that surprised me. Yeah, it's, it's, it was interesting for me as well. I, you know, I, I thought it was probably because African journalists weren't drawing that connection um, to to Africa's access to vaccines, you know, back to the, the joining of COVAX. Um, obviously, China has been has been very prominent in, in in relation to COVID issues in 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 Africa, not least because of all of the donations from people like the Jack Ma Foundation um, to to the continent from early on, but also the fact that of all of the world leaders um, of major powers, Xi Jinping is is quite unique in in repeatedly you know kind of drawing attention to African access to the vaccine and and kind of making this point you know throughout its its his interactions with African leaders that Africa won't be at the back of the queue. I think this is the nightmare in Africa is the idea that rich countries will hold the vaccine and Africa will be left to deal with with a, a COVID crisis for several years on. Um, you know, so so we'll, we'll have to see, you know, kind of how that comes out. But this, is, I think, is an encouraging move. And two very important points before we get to our discussion today. Number one is that the Chinese have made agreements in both Egypt and Morocco to set up vaccine manufacturing facilities. And again, that was an indication that maybe they're going to go it alone. Uh, Also, very quickly, as many of you may know, COVAX is an agreement that the United States has not taken part in because of its close relationship with the World Health Organization, which is an organization that the United States and the Trump administration believes is too close to China. So those are some of the points on the board that we're going to discuss today. And we're so thrilled to have a Chinese perspective on this issue because that's been missing in the discourse. George Zixiang Zhou is a policy and advocacy associate at Bridge Consulting, which is a Beijing-based consultancy that works with nonprofits and international non-governmental organizations. Uh, Bridge Consulting has done work with the Jack Ma Foundation, the World Health Organization, and most importantly for our discussion today, they've also worked with the Gavi Alliance that is part of the COVAX, what we've been talking about 
I also want to point out that George has worked in Washington, in Kenya, and obviously he's in Beijing and he's Chinese, and he joins us on the line from the capital. George, a very good evening to you. Welcome to the program. Uh, good evening to uh, Eric and Kobus. It's nice for having me. It's great to have you on the show. You've been studying China's vaccine diplomacy and what they're doing in this vaccine space, and we're really eager to hear more about what you found. Let's go back to May 18th. And that is when uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping delivered his speech to the World Health Assembly that any future vaccine would be made available as a, quote, global public good. Since that speech, Chinese diplomats and various stakeholders have been talking about this global public good. But no one's really defined it. And so that's what we're kind of struggling to understand, looking at it from an African point of view. What does that actually mean? There was some indication about three weeks ago where they introduced the idea that it would not necessarily be free. And that kind of caused some confusion. Could you help us understand from your understanding, and just to be clear, you obviously don't work for the government, you don't represent the government, so we're not expecting you to kind of speak on behalf of Xi Jinping here, but just what do you think in the eyes of Chinese policymakers they meant when they said a global public good? Yes, uh, sure. And uh, I think when President Xi Jinping made that announcement at the uh, summit, uh, when he talked about global public good, it really caused a lot of the, it really caused a lot of reaction amongst pol- policymaker and people around the world because you know what exactly does it mean? Do you say uh, will it be free? Will it just be provided by China to, uh, to other country? And these are all questions people have in mind. And honestly, the even after China now have announced they will join COVAX, they still haven't really gave a very clear definition of what would a global public good mean. And honestly, among uh, academia or policymaking community, people really don't have a clear definition of this. But I think we can get some uh, really good indication from the Chinese side since announcement on joining the COVAX. Uh, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, stated that they, were, they will continue to work with COVAX partner and really contribute its share to the global fight against the pandemic to safeguard all human beings. And one of the really core principles of COVAX is to get enough vaccines, uh, get enough safe and effective vaccine and distribution among all countries, all participating countries uh, uh, in a timely fashion and in an equitable, equitable way. And I think as China signing on to this uh, facil- uh, COVAX facility really means they are buying this prince, uh, buying on this uh, principles, and they are also agreeing with how this uh, uh, vaccine will be shared among country, not just developed country, but also among developing country in Africa as well as other part of the world. So that I think is a thing we can really tell by what is China doing right now, uh, like how, about how they understand what this global public good means. Would you mind just laying out, you know, exactly what COVAX is, who who the main kind of, you know, stakeholders are, and and what what the kind of main, um, you know, kind of parameters of the cooperation actually include. So, um, COVAX to put, COVAX is like to put it simply, is a global risk sharing mechanism for pooled uh, procurement and uh, equitable distribution of uh, COVID-19 vaccine once it's eventually uh, approved and become available. So it is a pillow of the WHO's access uh, to COVID-19 tool accelerators. Uh, it is conveyed by CEPI, uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, as well as the WHO. And in addition to uh, speeding up the search for effective vaccine for all countries, it is also working on support and supporting and building of manufacturing capacities and buying of supplies. So according to its plan, they can make 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine um, available and equal, fairly distributed by the end of 2021. That's uh, uh, objective right now. And the plan right now, the, the plan to make this is a fair and equitable distribution is that uh, every country signing on, regardless whether you will be a developed country self-financing it or a developing country that receive uh, f- funding support from uh, one of the COVAX's uh, mechanism called COVAX uh, AMC Advanced Market uh, Commitment Mechanism. Uh, you will receive no more than 20 no more, uh, vaccines that 
covers no more than 20% of your population. And according to the Gavi and WHO's recommendation and plans for now, that will cover the essential health, social care worker, people, high risk population, uh, for example, the elderly, the people with pre existing condition, pre existing or underlying condition. Uh, they will only get 20% until uh, they will only get 20% until everybody gets that number. And after that, then you know, if you have an existing bilateral agreement with other vaccine manufacturer, that does not count as a part of 20%. So that's really what uh, the COVAX, uh, uh, COVAX facility is and how it plans to uh, carry out this plan to distribute COVID-19 vaccine uh, equitably uh, among all countries. Do you know if the COVAX Alliance has certain transparency requirements as to the quality of the vaccines? And because this has been one of the issues about the Chinese process, and not maybe not just the Chinese, the Russians as well and others. Now, Russia is not participating in COVAX, but certainly the Chinese have been very opaque in their development process of their COVID-19 vaccines, in some cases for understandable reasons, given the incredible value of the intellectual property. But at the end of the day, people are going to have to inject this in their bodies, and they want to know that what they're putting in their bodies is been properly tested, properly vetted, is and, and been well produced. Does COVAX force the Chinese, as far as you know, to reveal more about the process that up until now, it doesn't seem like they've been very transparent? Yeah, that's a, absolutely a great question. And I think the, uh, when the policymaker designed the COVAX uh, facility, they certainly consider the difference between different countries' FDAs and their vaccine uh, R&D process. So uh, according to the Gavi and WHO, all per vaccine, per all doses purchased under COVAX facility uh, will be purchased when they are licensed and WHO qualified, which means they have to obtain the WHO pre-qualification, which... Uh, um, it's an indication of this vaccine passed a certain unified standards that has that was set by WHO, and I think that will really tell you that the WHO and the Gavi and also SEPI are really care about the quality and efficacy of the vaccine. They want to make sure this is. A, they do not rush this process. They want to make sure people will get, like you said, putting their body as safe and quality products. And the best way, I think, to ensure this right now is to make sure it get the WHO pre-qualification. And like you said, uh, we don't know if COVAX will purchase uh, any COVID-19 vaccine manufactured and developed by China to be distributed uh, among developing country or and country outside China. But if they do, that those Chinese vaccines will have to get WHO pre-qualification, which I think is a quite reputable process that really can give people, the and the public, confidence in the vaccines. Um, you know, on, on that point, um, we've, we've seen, um, you know, in, in, in different countries, you know, applications of, of, of very early applications of vaccines that, that seem to not have gone through, uh, f you know, kind of full vetting processes, uh, particularly some of the treatments given to President Trump in, in his own COVID infection. Um, how worried are you about, about kind of unlicensed inf um, treatments, you know, kind of being used in, in, in different places? And how effective do you think the COVAX um, alliance is going to be to, to, to tamp that down? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, I think right now we are, like you mentioned, in the U.S., we see, are seeing President Trump receiving uh, treatment that was not authorized or now approved by the U.S. FDAs. And uh, there are countries that are... Um, injecting people uh, uh, with unproven, uh, unprequalified un pre qualified COVID-19 vaccines under emergency use processes, etc. But uh, I think for COVAX facility, I'm not really concerned that will be really widespread use of unproven, unprequalified COVID-19 vaccine. Because the rule has been very clear they, when they sign the agreement uh, with a vaccine manufacturer and vaccine developer, and uh, the WHO's expert as well as CEPI's, uh, they have their own managed and monitored portfolio of a very diverse portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines in different countries. Uh, the WHO are also tracking their clinical trial. Uh, Gavi is also paying close attention to that. So they're really really, really value the safety and safety of those vaccines, safety and quality of those COVID-19 vaccines. So I don't think they will really rush their decision or rush the distribution and of the vaccine. 
But it's my understanding, though, that already in China today, they are distributing vaccines that have not completed phase three clinical trials. I think the People's Liberation Army is taking some. And at the same time, also United Arab Emirates has approved uh, distribution of non phase three clinical trial completed versions of the vaccine for emergency use as well. Is that correct? As far as you know, that China is now using a COVID-19 vaccine that has not gone through that entire process. Uh, yeah, that, that is true that uh, the Chinese government as well as some, uh, as well as some uh, vaccine developer have injected people. Uh, I would really need to emphasize a relatively small number of people with this kind of on uh, v- uh, vaccine before they completed all uh, clinical trial and the re- regulatory approval process. But uh, based on what the Chinese government have said, they actually uh, stated recently, uh, they will not uh, v- they will not vaccinate their entire population or a big num- large proportion of the population until they have really finished all the uh, clinical trials and the approval process. They actually specifically laid out how they will vaccinate the whole population. They do not plan to vaccinate their whole population simultaneously at once. For obvious reasons, they don't have that many vaccines available, and it is just from both the logistics standpoint uh, point and policy standpoint is really a viable solution. So they plan to vaccinate the high-risk population that, like I mentioned before, the uh, healthcare, social care worker, the essential worker, the costume worker, etc. cetera, uh, first. Then they will vaccinate the high-danger population, which include the elderly people, pregnant women, the uh, children, and people with underlying conditions underlying pre-existing condition, then they will move on to the rest of the normal, the rest of the population, the normal people. So they really plan out this long process and they are setting out, you know, producing the vaccines throughout 2020, the rest of 2020 and 2021. So these are all signs they are waiting to get confirmed that this vaccine uh, or any number of vaccine will pass all clinical trials and get approval from the Chinese CFDA. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Very quickly, though, I wrote a column few weeks ago called China's high risk, high reward strategy. And because it is very, very risky what they're doing with this uh, commitment to the global public good, the rewards are enormous because if China can be seen as ridding Africa of COVID-19, especially at an affordable rate, given the economic crisis that's now underway, uh, there will be an enormous amount of goodwill that's built. However, if China is responsible for a distribution strategy that goes awry, much as we've seen, for example, with some of the Jack Ma Foundation donations in places like Kenya and Somalia and Tanzania, which kind of fell into corruption and all sorts of other things because it just left control of the Chinese distribution process. Imagine, for example, on social media, if you know somebody takes the Chinese vaccine and their baby dies, and all of a sudden, boom, it is, the Chinese vaccine killed my kid. And you can imagine in this polarized environment that we live today, how that would be devastating for China's public image. So that's why we said high risk, high reward. Do you get the sense when you're talking to people in Beijing that they have an awareness of the risks associated with this commitment to distribute the vaccine as a global public good? And it should be noted that the commitment to distribute the vaccine is not just to Africa, but to all developing countries, South America, South Asia, here in Southeast Asia as well. So it's a very big promise. Do you get the sense that when you talk to people in the public health community in China and Beijing that they have an awareness of the of the risks associated with it, or are they focusing more on the upside? I think right now, I mean, yes, people are starting to consider about the distribution and eventually administration of the vaccine to people uh, all around the world. But you know, we're still, you know, we still don't have a working vaccine right now. I think people's a lot of people's attention are still on that. But yes, I do think people started paying attention to the distribution issue. Uh, I believe as an expert already given the estimation that. For the 7. billion people around the world, if everybody needs one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, that will require at least 8,000 Boeing 747 uh, air car, uh, cargo aircraft to carry it around the world. That's just a sheer number. So I think everybody knows this will be an incredibly difficult logistic operation, probably the largest peacetime logistic operation uh, humankind ever organized. So I don't think anybody in China, the policymaker, the public health official, or people working for international organization are underestimating this task. 
But I think that's, that's the importance of joining the COVAX facility. So we have been, so we're here at Bridge has been working with WHO, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Gavi here in China for years. And one of the reasons we really advocate for China to join COVAX is because all the organizations we mentioned above have a long and uh, rich experience of doing this kind of work. Gavi, WHO, and UNICEF F, and other organizations has been vaccinating children in, and adults in Africa and other parts of the world for decades. And then, well, recently, uh, recently, Africa announced uh, the successfully eradicated wild polio. That's a proof that it's a decade-long successful vaccination campaign. So they have the infrastructure, they have the experience, they have trained house workers on the ground to carry out this mission. And, but they have never done this at this level. We're talking about 1.2 billion people living in Africa and you know, the 7.8 billion people living around the world. Uh, ideally, they should all be uh, vaccinated. So they, 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 they can do this, but they need more resources and more support. That's why China joining co the COVAX facility is so important. Because again, China alone can now solve this problem. Like you said, the China's capacity is, they have a lot of, uh, they can do a lot of great things, but they can, again, they do not have the capacity to solve all this problem we just mentioned on their own. So that's why I think, you know, the China is aware of this problem and Probably that's one of the reasons joining COVAX to make uh, fulfilling its promise just a little bit easier. Is, is, what is the thinking at the moment in, in, in COVAX about the timeline for, for all, of this, all of this work? Um, you know, we, we, we're, seeing, we're seeing such divergent, you know, uh, projections to, coming from different commentators, some talking about, uh, about possible viable vaccines being available this year, others pushing it back to kind of mid-2022. Um, you know, w when do you think this kind of global rollout will realistically start? Yes, so there are certainly a lot of people making a lot of uh, estimations, and we are uh, that we're seeing like wildly different timeline on when the COVID nineteen vaccine will become available. And I think you know the best thing we can do right now is not to give people really crazy idea of when they should expect their own vaccine. Uh, that they can use and protect them against uh, this virus because really, really nobody know. Because uh, even though there are, like you mentioned, 10 different uh, COVID-19 vaccines in phase three clinical trial right now, there's no guarantee that any of them will you know, su uh, become successful at the end. So that's why I would say, that's why the COVAX facility and especially SAPI are keeping a very diverse, they're keeping an eye on and manage a very diverse portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines. There are different type of vaccine, different type of COVID-19 vaccine, in different stage of development, developed by different country in clinical trial all around the world. And they are, you know, any of them could be successful, any of them, of them could fail. And that's why, you know, well, that's why when I introduced the COVAX facility, it's important to mention, is it really a risk sharing mechanism because there's so much uncertainty ahead of us. And, you know, we cannot really rely on one vaccine or one country or even a group or one type of vaccine. So this is probably the best solution in stream right now uh, because, you know, we really don't know much. If it's such a great idea, which I agree it is, and I think you agree as well, why do you think it took China so long to come around to joining COVAX? So I think, as you can see, uh, I see uh, China's in, China has a long existing relationship with uh, Gavi. It's actually, uh, it's, all, it's actually the first country that transformed a Gavi um, uh, a receiving country to a donor to Gavi. It's, it used to receive... Uh, a support from Gavi on vaccinations, and in just a few uh, and a few years ago, they actually graduated from the program and started donating money to Gavi. So they obviously have a long working relationship with Gavi, and uh, the Chinese leader have made it very clear their support for the WHO. So uh, and they have always stated that they support the Covax facility. But like I said, they have um, they did they did mention in their statement that China. Half of, as you mentioned too, the China have several vaccine, uh, COVID nineteen vaccines that's in uh, phase three clinical trial, and you know they're leading, really this kind of R COVID nineteen vaccine R and D, and they have ample uh, production capacity. Uh, they estimated they can manufacture up to six, their annual production capacity will be six hundred ten million doses, 
uh, 610 million doses by the end of this year, and by 2021, the estimated production capacity will be 1 billion. So there has been, I believe, there could be a lot of discussion uh, talking, well, you know, how, how, what will be the best way for us to fulfill this kind of plan? What is the best way, like you said, to uh, deliver and distribute the vaccine in Africa and the other part of the uh, developing in world, and I'm sure they are aware that this, like you said, is a high risk, a high reward uh, mission. So I think this is this is probably explain why it took them a while to make the decision to make this commitment, because we don't know exactly what commitment they made to the Covax yet, but I'm no doubt they made commitment and uh, for the Covax facility on what they would do. So I think just the sheer uh, size of this issue and the importance of it probably explain why it took them so long to you know make this decision as you pointed out you know the the at the heart of the of the COVAX agreement is um, is that a certain percentage of each participating country's population will you know will will get um, this vaccine um, in the case of extremely poor countries um, I'm you know I'm thinking of, of a country like Yemen for example there seems to be relatively little difference between the lowest you know, kind of the the poorest and most at risk twenty percent of the population, and the the twenty percent of the population slightly less at risk. Um, you know, is is there provision for extremely poor countries to have a larger percentage of their populations uh, receive the vaccine? Well, right now, so the how this uh, COVAX facility set up this distribution is that, uh, like I mentioned before, so every country getting enough vaccine to cover 20% of the population. That is to, you know, to really follow uh, through on their fair distribution rule. But Gavi did uh, make, uh, make sure that we will save 5% of the overall vaccines that they uh, procure in case of any emergency or major outbreak that occurs. So like you mentioned, for example, in a country like Yemen, if the 20% of vaccine uh, they received under the basic COVID, uh, COVAX uh, distribution plan, uh, it's, not, it's not enough to protect their population against a major COVID-19 outbreak, then I would say that will fall under the emergency program. Then the WHO and Gavi, as well as other stakeholders, can decide to use the, you know, the five percent overall uh, vaccine they uh, vaccine they procure the stockpile to really help them out. I would say I would say so. They definitely uh, really stressed on the fair distribution principle, but they also consider this kind of emergency situation. Not necessarily in a, just a poor country, but could be also a, you know, a richer country, but with a major outbreak. So that's, I would say, will be a solution to the problem you just mentioned. I want to go back to this quality issue that you brought up and the perceptions about Chinese quality, especially related to pharmaceuticals, because in places like Africa, combating counterfeit pharmaceuticals from both India and China remains a very pressing problem. So it's not surprising that a lot of people are skeptical in places like Africa about the quality of Chinese pharmaceuticals and vaccinations and whatnot. And there might be some reluctance to take on a Chinese made vaccine. So I say, I'll, I'll give me the, the AstraZeneca one. I don't want the Chinese one. That perception is very, very strong that Chinese equals low quality made in China, they say. Do you have any sense whether or not there are discussions within the public health community in China as to how to combat that and overcome that if they are aware of it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I absolutely agree with you what you said. So I think this is two part of this problem. The first part of the problem is, like you said, it's a perception problem, a PR problem. There, there may be some Chinese products of a good quality, uh, maybe good quality health products, medicine or vaccine, but people, people in Africa just don't want it. Because, you know, the perception is the Chinese vaccine. Yeah, but it's, not, it's not just a perception. There really are counterfeit Chinese medications. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, like I said, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm just separating the, the, the two problems. So for that, I think uh, that's why I think a lot of people in China and uh, so their international organization are working on to devise more effective and better communication strategy and uh, outreach strategy to show people, to convince people that their vaccine of good, are of good quality. So, so like the, getting a WHO pre-qualification, et cetera. So that's the first part of this. And uh, the second part, like I think we say sometimes, when you have a PR problem, it's because you have, you have an actual problem. There are indeed, there are still problems with the Chinese uh, vaccine industry. Uh, the 2018 Chinese vaccine uh, industry scandal really shocked China. 
and really gave a lot of critics out of China, uh, I told you so moment. Could you explain what that 2018 scandal was for those who are not familiar? Yeah, sure. So in 2018, it was discovered that a major Chinese uh, vaccine developer has uh, fabricated production and production data and uh, really uh, production data and, uh, and also along with other inspection data. And uh, a lot of their substandard vaccine uh, end up uh, in the market, not just in China, also China as well. So that was a really major event that shook the Chinese uh, public and the regulator. And like I wrote in a recent article, ever since the Chinese regulator have taken on very regular, a uh, rigorous revamp of his regulatory uh, system as well as industry, they introduced the completely revamp of the vaccine re regulation system in 2019, and uh, just right before the COVID-19 pandemic. And they are working with international partners to adopt more international standards to regulate in such, uh, this vaccine industry, just as many experts recommended. Actually, most recently, the Chinese regulator just published a revised measure for the administration of drugs registration in March and an updated good clinical practice in April, both which have incorporated international standard and guideline that's, you know, again, it's improvement of the old one. So these are all signs the Chinese are definitely aware of this issue and they are working with, you know, international partner, their vaccine developing uh, developer to really uh, solve this problem. And just go back to the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I, I certainly understand, like you said, there are still criticism outside China, even within China. Now, it, uh, people expressing concern, but in addition to the measures they have already taken, we have also heard from WHO official who said they are already working with uh, Chinese vaccine developer uh, getting their uh, COVID-19 vaccine pre-qualifying. That would in involve a lot of complicated inspection pr uh, process, verification process of their date clinical trial data, of their uh, manufacturing, manufacturing process, etc. And uh, SEPI, one of the organizers of the COVAX facility, actually right now is in invested, are invested in two Chinese uh, development vaccine, and they are we are closely involved in their clinical trial as well as the R&D process. So I would say, like I said, there is certainly a PR problem, there is certainly an extra problem, and we are definitely seeing the industry, the regulator, are working with international partner to try to solve this problem. And when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine, I think they're really trying to make it up to the international standard. We've seen we've seen a lot of a lot of commentary, particularly also you know in, in the coverage of of the fact that China joined, um, uh, uh, you know kind of about the need to to move against vaccine nationalism and the idea that some countries will either hoard vaccines or you know kind of other kind of nationalist you know interferences in 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 a smooth global rollout of the vaccine. How worried are you about that? Uh, you know, kind of causing problems you know in in, in the rollout to, to this vaccine. Yeah, uh, I think that's very uh, that's definitely a legitimate concern, and we are already seeing a lot of a developed country, a rich country, uh, buying up, uh, buying up, uh, buying up and pre-ordering COVID nineteen vaccine. Uh, really, uh, some of them are expensive, some of them are cheaper price, and uh, I think according to a study, uh, according to a recent study, that uh, out of the uh, about out of the, all the uh, current estimated uh, COVID-19 vaccine production capacity, uh, mo more than half has already been ordered by developed country. So there's a real concern that uh, developing country and those con and, uh, developing country, especially those in Africa, would not have access to this really invaluable COVID-19 vaccine in time, uh, similar to the previous uh, pandemic that the world have experienced. I would say that's why the, the, the Gavi, WHO, and SEPI, as well as other, other as well as uh, organizers, other organizers and stakeholders, really work together hard to push for more country uh, participating in the COVAX uh, facility. As a matter of fact, I believe after China joined, there's more than 170 countries joining right now, and that's a large proportion of the world population. And uh, you know, people are really buying in. People and uh, people, uh, as part of the agreement, uh, some of them even some of them under the agreement, uh, will agree to also share part of their pre-ordered, allocating part of their pre-ordered vaccine with the COVAX facility. And I believe once we uh, vaccine is approved, we'll see how exactly that works. And these are all, like I said, the problem is real, but they are also working on. Uh, 
working on a solution. So I don't really believe there's a silver bullet that can end this pandemic like right now. But I would say the closest thing we'll, we'll have is international cooperation. This is really a global problem and it, need, it requires a global solution. So we need cooperation uh, between countries and manufacturing, distributing the vaccine. We also need really effective communication strategy to, commu to help communicate between countries, stakeholders, like what you guys doing as a China African project and our team doing in Beijing to really promote this idea, the importance of international cooperation and global solidarity, which will be the key to help end this pandemic and improve global health security. This pandemic, I believe, has caused a lot of suffering and it certainly gave rise, like you said, a lot of, ra a lot of radical, polarizing, dividing voices and forces around the world. But I believe if there's anything good that we can get out of this pandemic, it should be really be the spirit of the international cooperation, which I really believe will get us out of the pandemic. And the COVID facility, now with more than 170 countries participating, is a great example of that. Well, that's certainly the view of 170 countries. Obviously, it's not the view of the United States government, nor is it the view in Moscow as well. So there's not consensus worldwide on it, but nonetheless, it is a prevailing view. Also, one other point to complement what George said, China has indicated that it will commit to 1% of its vaccine purchases from COVAX in order to support COVAX. So that is interesting as well. George Zhishangzhou is a policy and advocacy associate at Bridge Consulting, which is a Beijing-based strategy and communications consultancy that works with nonprofits and international NGOs. They work with the Jack Ma Foundation, the World Health Organization, and also the Gavi Alliance. So we're great and very happy to have had you to be able to explain what's going on with COVAX and to shed some light on what the thinking is in Beijing. Uh, George, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much. It was a great talking to you guys. Kobus, there's one very, very important aspect to this whole COVAX debate that we haven't talked about yet, but I think it's we really have to, to address, and it is the geopolitics and the politics. So there is a benevolent part of it, which is clearly part of the, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's public diplomacy, whatever you, soft power, I don't know what you want to call it, but when he called it the global public good, that was definitely a push to use the vaccine as an opportunity to extend China's influence, its agenda, its politics, all of those different things. That's what countries do. And they're not alone in doing this, by the way. I, I don't fault them for that, but that is part of the agenda, no doubt. But at the other part of it, there is a, a political component to this that is very explicit uh, from the Chinese point of view. Uh, and let me get the language here that, that Xi Jinping himself used. He called it, quote, an important political task is to find the vaccine. Now, that is both politically important domestically in China, but also externally as well. And I have to think, and they have not articulated it this way, but because the U.S. has not signed on to COVAX and because the United States has removed itself from the World Health Organization, China clearly sees a very, very ambitious soft power play here to differentiate itself from the United States and to have another opportunity to build rapport with countries in Africa where they're bringing in a vaccine, which the United States is not doing. So I think this falls within the paradigm of the U.S.-China confrontation. It adds to the kind of optics of the U.S. versus the rest of the world. You know, the, there's so many countries joined this alliance, and then the, you know, the two of them, you know, the U.S. and Russia not having joined it. Um, you know, kind of it, it, it strengthens the wider narrative, I think, you know, that, that China tries to promote also, which is that it's the only superpower that's really interested in, in the developing world. Um, you know, and obviously there's lots of holes to pick on that particular story, but but at the moment, you know, it, at, at this kind of crisis moment, one can see how that could translate into into real kind of soft power dividends. When we look at the African countries who are positioning themselves to take both the Chinese vaccine as well as COVAX vaccines from different providers, it looks like they are trying to get the best of all worlds. They're not committing to one or the other. The best example of this is Morocco. Morocco has signed an agreement to manufacture the Chinese vaccine. I don't know which one in particular, but one of the four that's currently in trials. At the same time, they are very, very active within the Gavi Alliance. So I think that's going to be the strategy from the point of view of a lot of African countries is to be able to get the vaccines wherever and whoever will give it to them at the cheapest rate. Again, we got this indication from the Chinese that it's not all going to be free, and that may have tampered some of the enthusiasm that initially came out when Xi Jinping said 
a global public good. One of the key distribution challenges, and there are going to be many, as George said, this is probably going to be the largest peacetime logistics operation in human history, in, or at least in modern history. I can't think of any other time when the entire planet, every single human being, was to receive a vaccine. And it may not be every human being, but a significant portion of us will get it. And so we think about a couple different challenges specific to Africa. Number one, there's a cold chain that has to be maintained for this vaccine. That means that the vaccine has to be maintained at 40 degrees, minus 40 degrees centigrade, minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a very difficult thing to do in a part of the world that lacks steady power, that is very hot, that has infrastructure problems, logistical challenges. That's challenge number one. And Kobus, I'd like to get your take on challenge number two. We mentioned early on in the discussion about the role of corruption, but the COVID-19 Millionaires documentary that came out by NTV in Kenya revealed the extent that which the Jack Ma donations went missing in Kenya. And it's probably not the only place in Africa where these donations went missing. How does that play into all of this in terms of the governance? And the concern is those two actually intersect because if the materials, the vaccines are taken and distributed illicitly, the cold chain may be broken. And as a result of the cold chain may be broken, then the vaccines go bad and then people will suffer and die from it. So the consequences of the cold chain and the logistics with the corruption issue in Africa, I think are very germane. Yeah, definitely. I mean, not only in Africa, we've seen similar problems in South America as well, you know, with lots of corruption around around vaccines and, and treatment and PPE. Um, yeah, this is definitely going to be a problem. Um, it's going to be a logistic problem and then within Africa, a, a, a political problem as well. Um, you know, I, I guess the one thing one can say also there is that, that compared to many other places, I think Africa is a, is a population that's kind of like already like hyper vigilant for, for for you know, kind of allegations of corruption, that doesn't necessarily stop corruption. Far from it, but at least there's a very vital kind of like very kind of energetic public discourse about corruption, and you know, very fast kind of um, jumping, popular jumping onto people who are who are um, accused of being corrupt. You know, so but again, that doesn't necessarily stop corruption. That's the sad, the sad truth. So yeah, that that's definitely going to be an issue. I think you know, in in the wider scheme, what it probably will come down to is is a kind of a patchwork process, you know, where different people get different vaccines, um, you know, different different kind of vaccines being deployed at the same time in, in, in countries in different areas, um, you know, just as kind of basically, we, we're going to have to see how it works, because it, as you said, it's basically an unprecedented effort. Like, how do you think all of this, and, you know, the, the, the again, the, the other side of the optics of, of the US stepping away from these kind of initiatives, how do you think that's going to affect the standing of the US in the world? I think it's going to confirm the cynicism that a lot of people have. And a lot may depend, in fact, on the upcoming election, because none of this is irreversible. So if Trump wins and, and reasserts the U.S. pullout of the World Health Organization and refusal to participate in COVAX, I think it will really validate for a lot of people what you talked about, this go to loan strategy. And in the minds of a lot of Africans, it'll probably kind of put further distance between say, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, the major countries, and the United States, which have been very prominent in those countries up until recently, especially on public health issues like PEPFAR and whatnot. If Biden wins, there is a very good chance that that could be reversed and that the United States will actually turn around to re-engage. So I think we can't answer that question until after the election, which the election takes place obviously on November 3rd, but we may not have an announcement as to who is winning until several days after that, if we're fortunate, if we're lucky on that. So that question is still to be determined in terms of whether or not that's the case. In terms of the Chinese side of all of this, I think there's, again, we have to see how the rollout goes. And you've seen how sensitive African civil society is to perceptions that China is duplicitous, is opaque, is not being fair, is, pref you know, is supporting governing elites. So for example, if we see instances of the Buhari family and Buhari's, uh, you know, in Nigeria, his community getting the vaccine first ahead of everybody else, whether or not it's true or not, but these perceptions are going to be incredibly sensitive and delicate. And if those perceptions are what become reality for a lot of people, 
that too could complicate this a lot. I mean, you know how fragile the situation we are right now with the Chinese on, on African social media. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely a worry, um, you know, but at the same time, like there's so many things are fragile and so many things are in, in crisis at the moment that we're going to have to see how they all interplay. I think that's good. That's actually one of the biggest issues. It's not only these individual factors, but how they kind of bounce off each other that I think is going to be very difficult to predict. One thing is that, again, while we've been somewhat negative in our outlook for the situation in Africa, corruption, distribution, the cold chain, all these other things, There's a chance, too, I want to put the other side of the story here, that Africa is actually better positioned than most parts of the world to distribute a vaccine like this because there are already very robust and and, and sophisticated health mechanisms in place to fight Lassa fever, to fight Ebola, to fight malaria and whatnot. So distribution in this may actually not be as challenging in Africa because of those institutions that are geared up for this type of public health pandemic. Whereas in other parts of the world, and certainly the United States does not present itself as any example or any model for anything when it comes to public health today, Africa may in fact, just as it has in COVID-19 mitigation on the public health side, really proven itself to be a much stronger candidate as a role model than other countries and other areas and other parts of the world. Again, we may be pleasantly surprised by how effective it is that they just lie into this distribution mechanism that's already there. Yeah, like I, I, I think this this point is not made often enough. Africa is road tested in terms of of these kind of widespread public health rollouts in ways that no, I think no other place is. Um, the um, you know it's 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 a continent that's dealt dealt with widespread HIV for decades, um, and it doesn't it doesn't have the same kind of um, or you know obviously like HIV is a complicated issue, but 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 Africa generally hasn't seen the kind of um, pathologization and isolation of HIV positive people that that we saw in the United States for example during in in the 80s and 90s um, you know and the in, in response to HIV, in response to TB, to Ebola, to all of these different health challenges, African countries, even very poor African countries, have, have community health networks that are really quite fine-grained and qu- quite well set up. Um, and I think this, this has all contributed to the fact that still, you know, kind of compared to many richer places, Africa's COVID-19 death toll has actually been quite low. Um, so, you know, so in that sense, I think there is reason to be to be kind of cautiously optimistic that, that once, uh, once Africa can get a vaccine, there'll be very effective in rolling it out. We've said that in 2020, at this point in 2020, there are two stories which are dominating the agenda. Number one is obviously the debt issue, and number two is going to be the vaccine issue, and it is now the vaccine issue. So these are the two stories dominating China-Africa relations through the end of the year and probably into the foreseeable future. Uh, We're glad that we had the opportunity today to speak with George because, again, getting Chinese voices into this conversation is extraordinarily difficult. So we're very, very grateful that George was able to join us. We're going to try and get more voices on this between now and the end of the year until the vaccine is out so we can better understand the diplomacy of it all, the medical side, the public health side, what role the Chinese are playing in this or not, and how this, of course, fits into the U.S., China confrontation that we're seeing as well. So this is a really exciting and fascinating topic. It brings some hope for us, actually. Hopefully that this will end, bring the end. The fact that we're talking about vaccines, Cobus, after what we've been through this year is just fantastic. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, it's a big step because normally vaccines take four to five years to make. And the fact that they've been able to do one in less than a year is truly remarkable. Let's hope it lives up to all of our expectations so that this nightmare can finally be over with. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. We are talking about vaccine diplomacy, and this is where I've been writing my high-risk, high-reward type of columns. Cobus is addressing it as well. In our daily email newsletter that goes out to our subscribers, we would love for you to be a part of our growing community of readers around the world. It's super easy to get started, just $3 for three months just to try it out. If you don't like it, you can cancel at any time. You've only lost three bucks. If you do like it, it's $15 a month after that, $7 a month for students and teachers. We really want to make sure it's accessible to to the academic community. Uh, Go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Of course, if you have any questions whatsoever about the podcast, the newsletter, and anything that Kobus and I said today, we're easily accessible. You can reach me at eric, E-R-I-C, at ChinaAfricaProject.com, and Kobus, C-O-B-U-S, at ChinaAfricaProject.com. We love getting your emails, questions, comments, critiques, and we get into long 
back and forth discussions a lot of times with folks. So please don't be surprised if you get a long email back from me. Uh, so I always love having these conversations. Please don't hesitate to reach out and say hello. So that'll do it. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, for Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. 